Thank you for listening to the Redfield Arts Review. This is your announcer, Mary Ann Perry. Brought to you by... This is Elizabeth Shepard. I starred in the Roger Corman movie, The Tomb of Ligeia. And now I have made a recording of the original story, Ligeia, by Edgar Allan Poe. I cannot for my soul remember how, when, or even precisely where I first became acquainted with the Lady Ligeia. Long years have since elapsed, and my memories feel through Ligeia, read by soul. Elizabeth Shepard, is now available on Audible, iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. And now, your host, Jennifer Rouse. Director Mike Flanagan's new Stephen King adaptation is Dr. Sleep, the follow-up to The Shining. Listen to the trailer for Dr. Sleep. When I was a kid, there was a place. A dark place. They closed it down and let it rot. But the things that lived there... They come back. Not many ride the bus this far north. You're running away from something. I'm running away from myself, I guess. You can hear me. You're magic. Like me. I don't know about magic. I always called it the shining. The world is a hungry place. A dangerous place. These people, they hurt people like us. These empty devils. They'll eat what chance. And they've noticed that little girl. Wow. Hi there. Get out of my head! Get out! I haven't felt power like that in so long. They're coming. Where are we going? There's a place. I'm ready. Yes, you run, dear. And then I will find you. And you will scream for years. Come play with us forever and ever. Writer-director editor Mike Flanagan made his first splash with horror film fans with his 2011 crowdsource-funded film Absentia. Absentia featured actors from Flanagan's student film days and genre favorite Doug Jones, the star of The Shape of Water and Pan's Labyrinth. His real breakout film in the horror genre was Oculus from 2014. Flanagan's next major film was Hush, released by Netflix in 2016. This led to writing and directing an adaptation of Stephen King's Gerald's Game for Netflix, and eventually to the adaptation of Shirley Jackson's novel The Haunting of Hill House for Netflix, released as a 10-episode film in 2018. The Haunting of Hill House has won raves and accolades from fans and critics. Stephen King said, The Haunting of Hill House, revised and remodeled by Mike Flanagan, I don't usually care for this kind of revisionism, but this is great. Close to a work of genius. I think Shirley Jackson would approve, but who knows for sure. Listen to the trailer for The Haunting of Hill House. Now I want you two to get good rest. What if I have a bad dream? I'm 
I'm sure we can handle any dream you have. What if I dream that you sent us away into the dark and me get hurt? Really hurt? And what if I'm so sad and scared of the dark out there that I put poison in me for years and years until my blood turns into poison? And my heart breaks right in half and I can't feel anything happy. Well, I can't stand it anymore and I, I have to die. And time on a silver table. It's my jaw wired shut. Why? Would you wake us up from a dream like that? We're not like any other family. We're different. Because of where we grew up. Hill House. Your mother, she was not crazy. Neither was your sister, neither is your brother, neither are you. That house. You don't have to worry now, sweetie. That really bad dream. Of course I'd wait. This conversation you're about to listen to between Mike Flanagan and Mark Redfield was conducted by phone while Flanagan was editing Before I Wake in 2015. And Flanagan was on pins and needles waiting on word that Stephen King would give his blessing for him to make Gerald's game. Please excuse the poor sound quality. The recording was originally recorded to be transcribed into a print interview, but this is Redfield Arts Audio, and we felt that hearing Mike Flanagan in his own words about screenwriting was worth a listen. We hope you do too. Here's Mark Redfield and Mike Flanagan. At what point was there any deviance in your path? In other words, uh, was it always, I wanted to be a filmmaker and I'll, and I'll write to do that? Or was writing even independently, uh, writing fiction, was that a part of it? Uh, I, 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 I'm talking to the screenwriter, but you know, was that something that was in place early? I, it was. Actually, the first script that I wrote, I was, it was my freshman year of college, and I was 18. I didn't know anything about writing, but I really wanted to make movies, and uh, I didn't really know how to get started doing that. Um, you know, no one's submitting scripts to college kids for, for their consideration. And, and so I wrote a, a college relationship drama called Perspective, that was 350 pages long. Wow. Uh, in prop format, it, oh, it, was, it was brutal. Um, it's, <laughs> you know, it, it's, God, it was unbearable. But it was the first time I ever actually sat down and tried to write. And, and nothing ever came of it except that I just really enjoyed the process. And um, then with, uh, with the other little, uh, the, what I've, I've come to call, like, the little Towson trilogy, um, you know, the, the, the only way to get things going was to, to self-generate. Otherwise, it's like your only options in school are either to, to generate something to work on or to just kind of take what comes with the directing classes, which will, best case scenario, let you direct a short, maybe your junior or senior year. And um, so, so for me, it was always kind of, uh, it was the only way to, to get anything done. Um, I, I had a lot to learn about writing, and I think it took me it took me at least four scripts to to crack you know just basic structural rules. So they were all really great learning experiences. Um, and then the hope after that was uh, when I when I made the move out west in two thousand three. Um, the the hope was that I could sell scripts. 
because nobody was going to hire me to direct at that point, and I was making a living, you know, editing bad commercials and reality TV and stuff. Um, so at that at that point, it was kind of like this is that was a hope for survival. Was maybe if I can't make a movie, I can maybe write one and sell it. Um, right, right. And yeah, but yeah, it was always um, I. I I was always hoping to, to be directing my own scripts, um, and you know, fortunately or unfortunately, I never really had an option to work on anybody else's. So, and, um, and it strikes me um, you're actually jumped a little bit ahead of me. So I want to back up just a little bit. It strikes me because yeah. I, I I had said you know I, I have seen every film you've made. I'm pretty sure everyone. I've never read uh, I've never read one of your screenplays ever. Uh, did do you? To this day, now, and, and, and you've got other things that are taking up a great, great amount of time, uh, certainly when you, you're in post-production and you're editing your films, and we're going to come back to that in a second, and, and how that relates to writing. But do you have a, a writing regimen, or does your regimen warm up? Uh, I, mean, I mean, do you have a regular writing schedule, or do you have to fix one into place when a project or, a, or an idea comes to you? How does it work with you? Uh, well, um, I was, I, I think I've always, always had kind of a hunger to write, so even if there was nothing that I was supposed to be writing, I'd be working on something, whether it was an outline or, or just trying to come up with log lines. Um, for process, I mean, with, with the college movies, it was, uh, you know, I, I got to make the first one, uh, Make Believe, and when it was finished, I, I looked at the movie and it was really kind of addicted to the, the process of, of making movies by that point. Like, it was such a, it was like heroin immediately. And the, the second the film was over, I wanted to do another one. So it was like, oh, okay, let me sit down and write another one. Uh, and then I saw that one through and, and saw the finished product and thought, oh, this could be so much better. Let me do another one. So it, it, it kind of was a sickness, actually, in the beginning. Um, and when I got out to L.A., uh, that was when I started writing with uh, Jeff Howard who had already sold several scripts at, at studio level out here um, with other writing partners. And so uh, he had seen the movies and, and kind of come at me and said, I think your, your voice is really interesting. And if you ever have a commercially viable slot, like you could really be a force to be reckoned with. And initially it was like, hey, screw you, man. Uh, <laughs> but he was absolutely right. And, and it, took me, it took me a couple of years to figure that out. And then once we started writing together, um, he really kind of showed me uh, the, the benefits of commercial viability. And I was able to kind of learn from his experiences with the studios, you know, um, what kind of sensibility was required to approach a script if you wanted to take it to market. Um, but even with all of his experience, it still took us, geez, um, seven years, eight years to sell something. Let me ask you. Let me yeah. let me ask you two questions because now this is a very, a very very different thing. You uh, get into a groove, project to project. You're you're able to, you're enjoying writing. So the solitary quality of that. But now you're collaborating. You're working with somebody, um, and 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 these either. And in your case, it's obvious after uh, uh, um, Oculus and. Uh, now you've got these other collaborations coming up and you've worked on scripts for uh, Somnia. I mean, obviously it's working. Um, how do you, how do you actually collaborate? Is there uh, a badminton game where, uh, or, or is it uh, Coen brothers or is it, uh, you know, i you know, you read about people who collaborate on a script together and they, you know, they, I, I, there was a team that wrote a, a series of pulp novels and they wrote, uh, they hopscotch uh, chapters. How do you, how do you collaborate, you know, after working, uh, you know, writing a bunch of screenplays by yourself? Uh, it's, it's changed over the years for, for the first, uh, for the first five years or so, um, we would get in a room together um, and just kind of stand around and brainstorm. And then we would sit together and work on the outline. Um, and most of the time, we would sit in the same room and take turns typing while the other one kind of paced. Interesting. And that way, we had kind of both of our voices into the script at once. Um, as t 
time went on and we got busier, especially as we started getting uh, rewriting jobs and writing assignments, um, we didn't have time to do it that way. And, and so it kind of became, at a certain point, it, it became a much more remote collaboration where we would piggy up the workload. Um, we would usually be in the same room to come up with the outline, which for us was a pretty fat document. It was, um, it was very specific. We'd usually do a 30 or 40 page outline for a feature draft. And the joke between us was, you know, if we triple spaced it, we could just turn it in as a first draft. <laughs> um, but it would have, it had dialogue, and it would have a lot of really specific structural notes. Um, and then we would kind of divvy it up, and you know, one of us would take Act One, one of us would take Act Two, and when we finished, we would trade and do a pass of each other's work. Um, and by the end, we kind of marry everything into one document. Um, for the last few years, as uh, as the movies have actually gone into production, and that's pulled me out of town for you know. For four to five months for production, and then when I'm in post, uh, we've, we've done an awful lot just on the phone and and sending documents back and forth. So I, I don't think we could have really built that workflow if, if we hadn't have had those five years where we were in the same room and kind of got to know each other's voices and strengths and weaknesses. And um, we've done, I think we've done all things said and done now, about 15, 15 scripts together. Um, how, which will never see the light of day and, yeah, yeah. how is it um, you know the expression kill your darlings how is it if one of you feels very strongly that something brutal must be done a choice must be made um, is there someone who defers to the other easily or uh, I mean how do you if, if you ever even come to this because it sounds like you've had you know a really winning collaboration and Oculus is seamless See the mirror hanging there? Face of silver, frame of black. Oculus of glass, I stare. I can feel you staring back. Hear your voice. Believe your lies. A window, portal, darkened door. Should you claim my staring eyes? My soul you hold forevermore. I don't know. I don't would know where one of you began or, or one of you really ended. And I, I do want to get to editing in a minute. But what happens if there is uh, no? I really want this, and the other says no. I really don't. I mean, how do you deal with that? Well, typically, if, if we've had a, a, a really solid disagreement about something, what we learned early on was that that means there's a problem uh, with the script. And it's typically not which one of us is right or which one of us is wrong. If we really vehemently disagree about something, you know, we kind of agree that that means we're both wrong, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that there's a solution somewhere in the middle that's actually going to be better for the story. Um, and that took a while to get to because he, there is absolutely ego involved with writing, and it's really tough to, to let go of something you're really attached to. Um, but we've been pretty good about it. You know, um, there tends to be kind of in the more in the second half of our, our working relationship it's, if, if it's a project that I'm going to be directing um, there tends to be kind of more of a you know more of a deference to, to what I want for that um, but Jeff will still you know really dig his heels in if he thinks that something is a mistake sure um, sure and yeah. with uh, with Oculus you know, that was a, actually one of the scripts. We had we had years to work on that outline. That's an, nobody was, was going to buy it. Oh, and, that's an entire so, yeah. That's an entire conversation because I find that fascinating about what you must have generated material, background thoughts, um, where the aha moments came over the years from the initial the initial concept, which is 
universal and brilliant, you know, a haunted mirror, uh, the, 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 the horror, the, the, the metaphor of, of everything that a mirror can give you, what went into the first short, and then, of course, you know, what you must have had time to uh, play with, uh, uh, because Oculus has, Oculus is so very well realized, it's so tightly realized, um, and I could go into kinds of things that are start to sound critical, and I mean in a positive way, in picking it apart, not sure. knowing what you were, what was behind the decision, you know, because things can change when you're on the floor and you're, you're limited to a budget. I like very much uh, a kind of horror thing where not too much is ever explained. Uh, and, I, and I, and you know, you're, you're dealing with tropes uh, that have come before. In, in other horror films and in just resonating with those the audience is already ahead of you which allows you to do other things and I think Oculus does that really really well and before I forget completely off the record that has nothing to do with this and, and it does it's a much longer talk the the the, the girl who played the kid uh, version yeah. my god yeah, I always bad, so. She's, yeah. uh, she was startling. And the second time I watched the picture, I really watched the actors, but particularly her, because she really struck me the first time I saw that. Let me jump around a little bit, and I do want to come back to yeah. Oculus and, and, and editing, but you're a voracious reader. With, with the kind of schedule that you have with your career now, uh, just the demands of how many hours there are in the day, are you able to keep your, your reading, your, your, are you able to keep that up? Not as much as I'd like. Um, I do believe that reading is, uh, it's like going to the gym for a writer. Um, it's, it's necessary exercise. And, um, you know, I, I don't have as much time as I used to to read, but uh, I will try to make time for it. Uh, particularly for me, um, I travel a lot more. And that's actually been great because I tend to, you know, I tend to approach an airport with a pile of reading. Mm. And that's kind of a time where I don't ever buy the Wi-Fi. No one can get me on the phone, and and you know, typically, especially if I'm traveling to set, which has been for me in Alabama yeah, right. uh, the last several years, right. going back to Alabama. Um, but uh, I, I do a lot of reading when I'm traveling, and then I fall asleep reading a lot. Um, I'll I'll finally kind of either finish my work for the evening or or you know finish playing with my son and. Right now I will read, and I'll, I'll get a couple chapters in and then pass out with the book or the Kindle on my chest. And um, I, I kind of religiously keep up with Stephen King's stuff, which is not the easiest thing in the world to do because he, he's so prolific. And every couple of months it feels like there's a new, you know, 700, 800-page novel <laughs> to, to digest. Right. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I, I think reading is so critical, and... and as things have uh, have really taken off on the directing side, I get submitted scripts a lot, and it's really nice to, to read other writers' scripts and see what they're doing structurally and see what, what else is out there in town. And um, that was something I tried to do very early in my career was power through as many uh, produced screenplays as I could find at Borders mm. and kind of like, okay, well, I love the Usual Suspects. What does it look like on the page? You know. Right. Um, yeah. And how does that translate? And it, it was really startling to me with a lot of wonderful movies how little of, of what you know of what I loved about them felt present in their scripts. Uh, how kind of bare bones they were. And um, it's been it's been really fascinating reading scripts um, from writer directors versus uh, just professional writers. Um. There, there's a phenomenon I think is interesting where it, one of two things happens with a writer-director where there's either way more detail um, about the style and, and visual components of the film uh, because they know what they're, you know, they, they're kind of transcribing their directorial vision onto the page, which I think is really fascinating. Well, or the opposite group, there's almost none because they've got it in their head and, and the script is just meant to be a basic blueprint for them. And I'm not and, sure... Um, no, that, that's that's all I had. Yeah, it's it's just because I, I think I, it's fascinating different ways people do it. What I think but, what I think I know about you is, I mean, you're very you're you're the acting in your films has always been strong. You know, Oculus I found incredibly tight, and again, you know, uh, the 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 acting uh, just being really really crisp and really 
natural, really believable, uh, which you need, I think, in this style of um, horror film. You know, this is not an arch, you know, goth. This isn't a Hammer horror film or a, you know, Sleepy Hollow or a Tim Burton, you know. Uh, and um, although I'd like to see you do something, I'd like to see you move in some other territories. Uh, uh, and I don't know whether these are comfort zones or not, but let me ask you two quick questions. You, you obviously... Uh, enjoy the process uh the you know uh, write with the door closed rewrite with the door open you're working with a partner jeff howard on a number of things right now um you're directing a number of these things right now so that's a whole other ball game uh actors will bring something to it you will have visual ideas to it i caught immediately i loved the small camera turn uh, when the husband and wife laid in bed, just nice visual touches. I mean, because one of the key things about horror films is what's outside the frame. And you're always worried about what's outside the frame. And then you are the editor, the film editor of your pieces, where in a lot of ways you're able, with whatever forces are working, you know, for whatever nefarious ends, the producers, but you're able to then work on the final draft of your piece. Talk a little bit about that. You, does anything, where is your brain when you're actually assembling footage and watching it come to life and cutting it tighter? And, and uh, Because I also find Oculus uh, tight as a drum. Um, so where's the writer brain when you're actually looking at this and somebody is, you're showing them a scene or you yourself are looking at a new cut of something and like... Where, where? Tell me about that a little bit. What's happening to you? Well, kind of quite by accident. I think the the most developed skill set that I was able to grow in Los Angeles was editing. Um, it was my day job, and I hated it, but um, it kept me alive. And I learned more about filmmaking, learning how to edit, uh, than kind of anywhere else. So, what's you know, I, I, I do believe in the, um, I don't know who said it originally, but people throw it around out here all the time, that, you know, you make three movies, the one you write, the one you shoot, and the one you cut. Right. Um, and more than anything, I think my editor brain actually kicks in strongest in the writing stage. Um, and with Oculus in particular, the edits, a lot of the editorial choices we made were written into the script, um, which limited us in production, because it was like, well, we're not going to be able to solve this transitional moment in post we need to get it right right now because we were doing a lot of the uh the timeline editing you know sometimes within one shot and um what i've found in in post that, that's been really useful for me is uh to throw away uh, if, if i can to throw away any preconceptions that i had writing and even ones i had on the set and kind of try to approach the material as though i'm seeing it for the first time um, the edit, you know, I think is where the movie is made and really stands up. So I try to protect my, myself as an editor in the writing um, and be very specific about what a scene should be. And then I really try to protect myself on set, sometimes by making sure I have enough options so that editor Mike will be able to deal with it, or sometimes to make sure I don't have options so that no one can come in after the fact and alter something that I really believe in. Um, good, good. And, yeah. and that, that, gets, uh, that gets tough for producers because they'll look, you know, while we're shooting and be like, why do we only have three setups and, you know, two takes of the scene? And it's like, well, because there's only really one way I think it can be accomplished and I'm not going to provide additional options in editorial because someone will use them at some point. Right, right. Um, and so that's, that's always kind of a tough tightrope to walk. Um, but when the footage for Oculus came into my assistant editor um, to digitize and, and organize in the app, he sent a panic email out to our producers um, where he said he thought he was missing footage, that there wasn't enough footage uh, there to make the scenes executable and to make the movie work. Um, and after I got into the cutting room and was able to work on it for a couple of days, he came back and he was like, oh no, actually, the way these, these bins are laid out, it's like Ikea furniture. There's kind of everything you need to build it, but nothing extra. Right. And if you don't follow the, the 
instructions, if you don't follow kind of the template for the way the scene was, was shot, um, the scene can't be edited. And um, that's been really, that, that's been a method of self-protection for me because that way I, I'm at least confident when we get into post that a studio or a producer wants to make serious changes to the movie, uh, they often can't. And, you know, that that's also something that could really blow up in your face. Um, but uh, fortunately, so far, hasn't. And, um, and I think in Oculus more so because of the nature of... Um, what you're asking, the story that you're telling the audience, and you're asking them to slide between two time frames as the characters are doing it or not, and it's uh, it's tight as a drum, and it's very very clear, um, and uh, so there it's uh, it's obvious that someone looking at something and looking at um, the footage coming in, thinking half a scene is missing if they're not really yeah. clued into how that puzzle gets put together and then it's not a puzzle it's um it's uh it, it, and more so than any other film where you've played with anything like that uh where the and some of the other ones were pretty much straight narratives as well um how uh i, I want to go if you can can you go another 10 minutes yeah yeah i can do that yeah um because no, i don't don't chase me yet can we <laughs> Um, this is just a goofy question that I'll just stick in somewhere. Um, do you have any compulsion at any point that you might write some fiction, that you might write something outside of a screenplay? Oh, absolutely. I would love to write, write, uh, write a novel. Maybe? I would love to write a novel. Yeah, I would love to. Um, and there's one project I've been working on for a couple of years that started as a script, and then I started, I, I abandoned the script uh, at the end of Act 2 because I felt like it wasn't, nearly enough real estate to tell the story. Mm. Um, and I started working on a novelization for it, and uh, that's been kind of a project I, I come back to and dust off in between other projects. Um, but I would, I would love to do that. Um, and I've also been really curious about uh, writing a video game. Um, oh. I think what, what people are doing with video games these days is incredible, and a chance to tell an immersive story um I, I my brother sat me down and showed me uh he just made me watch him play the last of us okay yeah and, yeah well watching him play that is the best most emotionally absorbing zombie movie i'd ever seen <laughs> and um and my guy was riveted just sitting there watching him play it and the fact that he got to experience it in a first person way i, I was like this is a really becoming a, a powerful art form you know, uh, with respect to Roger Ebert, who said video games could never be art. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I disagree. Right. And um, I think that could be a really exciting, uh, a really exciting way to tell a story and to tell a really involved story that pulls a, a viewer in, in in a way that you don't get uh, from basic narrative uh, television and film. Um, so I would love to do that. It's it's a question of having, having an opportunity to do it. Um, and... Kind of the what I what I've been trying to build over the last few years is enough stability within the feature world that I could break I could branch out whether it's books or video games television would be really fun to play with and you know it's it's, it's very difficult to get a foothold um, in the industry in the studio system and once you do it's almost even more difficult to then break out of the mold you've created for yourself. Now, um, now in a way. Yeah. Um, you're you're leading right to where I uh, was hoping we would go. Can we talk about Gerald's game? Absolutely. Um, Be yeah, because I don't know when I first saw the notice come down the pike and what did that come out of the festival that that announcement that um yeah you know I thought because it's Stephen King and because it's not a Stephen King uh, supernatural horror, outright horror novel, um, this is the kind of thing that might allow you to, to, to branch or open roads, um, even though it's still a thriller, even though, you know, you're, 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 you're going to be using a lot of the same tools from the toolbox. Um, you know, it was just by nature of the property, maybe possibly open some doors up. And it was like, I hope this really happens. So cheerleading on that end. That's a marriage, isn't it? Working on the difficult things. For better or worse. Let's go in, get comfy. I 
that you think your husband will be back any minute. I'm trying to go for help. There's no one for miles. I'm Gerald? I'm sorry, baby. You don't get to know my name. I don't like this. I'm serious. Stop. I don't like that. Please. Stop it! Play. Is this really what it takes these days? Oh, I don't know. We were so wrong. We were happy once. Where were we? Gerald? What? What's oh. happening? Oh. Gerald! Time to wake up, honey. Five hours you've wasted screaming for neighbors that are half a mile away if they're mm -hmm. even here yeah. yet. How long do you think someone lives without water? Or... That will not work. No. You can pull till your wrists break. You're not getting out of those cups. Not real. Yeah. Little baby, don't say a word. Focus. You've been sleepwalking since you were 12 years old. That's a beautiful dress. He put you in those handcuffs way before Gerald did. You all right? You all right, Mom? You have everything you need to survive from the beginning. You just have to remember. Back up! If you don't wake up, you're gonna die. Well, I know you're a big Stephen King fan. We've always talked about that. And you know this novel inside and out. You've wanted to adapt it. I think uh, I know that about you. Um, oh, yeah. I, so I'm not curious right now how that happens, how somebody comes to the keys with, with Gerald's game. That's for the future. But let's talk about adaptation. Tell me. Uh, about Gerald's game and um, where you are with that creatively. I mean, where was the process, you know, from fantasizing? Because you know what Stephen King was for me was the um, apt pupil years ago. I, when I first read apt pupil, I thought, I want to make this into a movie. I, I, could, I saw it yeah. so clearly. Um, so what's the whole process uh, of Gerald's game with you? Well, I, I read it in college and immediately wanted to, to do a movie. I, I thought it was such an incredibly different and suspenseful book, and I, I, I read all of this stuff, and that one just blew me away. Um, my thoughts reading it were also that it was fundamentally unfilmable. Um, that the novel as it was, it was like, how do you turn this into a, a cinematic experience? And uh, for several years, when when I first kind of, when I got my, my first manager and, and agents out here, and they always ask you, you know, what, what you want to do. Um, I would always bring up Gerald's game, and we would try to pursue the rights. Mm. Um, and we would be declined every time. Um, and the reason I found out, you know, recently, the, the reason was that uh, Stephen wanted to hold on to that project for uh, him to direct. And so for 25 years, or 20 years, he would never let anybody have an option on it. Wow. Uh, and uh, we kept pursuing it, we kept pursuing it, um, and, uh, you know, always got the same answer. And then King saw Oculus and was a big fan of it and was even, you know, had gotten in touch with the studio and said he'd help promote the movie and give us quotes, you know, for the marketing. And, and so I was like, try again with Gerald King right now. Like, try, try it immediately. Yes. Um, and so they sent a proposal to him, and, and they said, you know, Mike really wants to do Gerald's game. And he said, well, I, I've long given up the idea that I would direct it myself, and, and I also am very curious. Uh, he had given one option to, I think, Nicole Kidman um, a couple of years ago, and, and she turned, or her team had turned in the draft, but he was just like, no, this, you know, deviates too far from the source material, which is something as a King fan I'm really sensitive about. Sure. Um... And uh, so, although, got, although, although, for the record, I love Kubrick's The Shining. <laughs> I'm just saying, I Mike. It. I hope we're still friends. Anyway, 
and it's funny because I get myself in so much trouble talking about The Shining. I, I, I love it, admire the hell out of the Kubrick film. I just hate it as an adaptation of The Shining. And that's it's fine. Good, yeah. yeah. The, the Stephen King fan in me is like, well, it's a great movie, but it's not. Shining. Uh, so anyway, yeah, now is the time. Uh, go. Uh, Gerald's game. Stephen, let's lock yeah. this down. So what happens then? Uh, so we got approved. Um, we basically got a, I think it was a nine month option on the, on the property mm. um, to, to write a script. And one of the things that King does is um, he's you know, hit a level in his career where he can control every aspect of that negotiation. There's, there's really no negotiating with him. And he'll say, okay, I'll let you write the script. You can't tell anybody about it. You can't do anything with it. Um, and then you send it to me. And if I like it, then I'll say, good, and you have a, a certain window to go into production or announce a start date. And if he doesn't like it, you literally destroy the copies of your draft and never talk about it. Wow. Um, it's, it's, Pretty mercenary, but you know one of the benefits of being Stephen King, and and, um, and protecting your work. I'm reminded, by the way, and is it okay to keep this in the uh, interview? Because this is a lot, a lot of this is I didn't know that about uh, uh, Stephen King, and I'm reminded of, and I love this story, and I and I have to um, double check this. I have to do some research before I attribute it to Richard Matheson. Who King is quoted as saying is you know his largest influence in in, in writing, but yeah, I am legend. Yeah, there is. I am uh, legend for, for King. Yeah, and there's an and it's, and it's I am legend that I think this is it, and I think it's 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 one of those things where you you know like which painter said this quote, but I think it's Richard Matheson. I think it's I am legend. Somebody said you know about the Will Smith movie to him. My God, I feel so bad for you. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, see what they did to your, your novel. And he turned and he pulled his novel off the shelf and he said, they didn't do anything to my novel. My novel's right here. But to have the kind of, you know, that's great for a, um, a writer to have that kind of um, control over their work. Um, so anyway, yeah. yeah so he's, a, he's, I think, appropriately protective of his stuff and, and has, you know, had, had such a career that it, that it affords him that level of control. Yeah. And, um, and so it was, it was nerve wracking because, you know, once we, once we had the deal, I, I went off to write and adapting, adapting your idol is really tricky because there are obvious changes that needed to be made to the story to, to make it visually cinematic. Right. And, um, there was a sensitivity with me where it was like, I, I think this is the best way to do it. You know, yeah, and I would sit there and be like, what would Frank Darabont do if he had this material? Like, what, who, who I think has been so effective at adapting his work. Yes. You know, yeah. like, what, what would he do with it? And um, so I went through the novel. Um, I, I still have the, the copy of the book that I used for the adaptation, which is just overflowing. I, I would take post-it notes and because I didn't want to deface the book by writing in the margins. Oh, wow. Uh, and I would stick post-it notes you know, sometimes 10 deep on a given page with, you know, um, with notes like, okay, this, this piece of dialogue needs to remain the movie untouched. You know, here's an idea for how to fix this issue. And the book ended up just ballooning. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a hardcover, hardcover uh, edition of Gerald's Game that's just overflowing with post-it notes. And it's, it, it looks like the work of a madman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then after that, I started back at the very beginning of the book and sat writing the outline um, with reference to specific numbered uh, post-its. And um, then just sat and tried to, tried to do the draft. We, we finished the draft very quickly and uh, submitted it to King. And, you know, the, whatever it was, six or seven days uh, waiting for his re reaction to the draft was one of the more successful moments of my professional career. Um, and he came back and loved it. Didn't have, he had no notes. And wow. came back, this is great. You know, this is exactly uh, the way I think the movie should be handled. I can't wait to see it and go with God. And um, and so that at that point, we announced the project and uh, started to go about looking for financing and casting. Right. Which is where we're still, still working all that out because that always takes the longest. And I've been finishing Somnia um, most of the year. Uh, Somnia will 
picture lock this Friday, and and then I've got a month of you know score and mix, and and then we'll see where it's at. But um, the timing has been great because it's allowed us to really take our time with making sure we find the right cast and right financial partners for Daryl's game because it was such a challenging piece of material. Um, it's very dark and not something that you know that a lot of people are going to look at and immediately say, oh, this is a, a clear commercial hit that I can compare to, you know, this movie, that movie, and this movie that came out in the last five years and hit now. Well. It's, it's a very bizarre animal. Yes. Um, so, Big Partners, is, is, we always knew it was going to be tough, but we also knew we had, you know, the kind of the 900-pound gorilla in the room of Stephen King. Right. Um, people take way more seriously than they take Mike Flanagan, so it's, you know, it's, it's been really a very different experience trying to get the movie off the ground with, with his support behind it. Um, and so my hope at the moment is um, that we'll be able to announce cast sometime in the next few weeks, and then I, I'd like to be in production on that project uh, February, maybe, after the holidays. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, um, it was... Certainly a unique, a, a unique writing experience because um, it was it was so frightening to take a piece of writing that I respected so much and the tiniest alterations to it, even structurally, to make it kind of even fit within the framework of a feature film. Um, every little move made me nervous. Uh, I, I imagine it's the way surgeons might feel before they cut something. You know, that it's <laughs> like one. One wrong move with your hand, and you can kill the patient. Right, and right. Um, and so it was. It was very delicate and and terrifying to uh, to be do. But at the end of the day, I think the changes that that we made lend themselves to a really visceral uh, viewing experience. But the spirit of the novel and uh, the the feeling when you get reading the novel are all protected. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a yeah, because you're all you're all big boys, and you know, I mean, King does really know this in the end too. That these are so completely different animals. They they are just they they they're they're absorbed completely differently. And if and if you yeah. can retain the spirit and the lifeblood and the life spirit of a of a of a novel, um, and not go off into wild directions, and I think he deep down knows that as well. Um, and I, I wonder if it was a help or a hindrance to have been so in love with a passion project. In other words, you it's in your it's in your it's in your hair, it's in your clothes, you know, like cigarette smoke. It's I don't mean to make it a negative connotation, but it's you know, Gerald's sure. game is something that you you've seen, you've dreamt about, oh boy, this would be, and then to sit down and do it, some of that work is there. It's about getting it out in different ways. I guess I guess if it was a cold project to you and you had to learn it, that would be a different thing. Um, but maybe it helped that you loved it so much. Um, I, I like to think it does. I, I think you know. I think where adaptations can fall apart, I think, is when people don't necessarily love the source material. Yeah. Um, and uh, because the thing is that the first people to buy tickets for an adaptation are people that do love it. The source material. Exactly. And you, you hope it'll it'll find a new audience. You, you hope it'll it'll be fresh for people who have never heard of it or never really gave the book a chance for whatever the reason. Um, but the first people in the door that you're going to have to, you know, the first person you have to please is the author, and then you've got to please the wave of people that love the material as much as you do. I agree. And, yeah. Yeah. If, if you can pull that off, then you you end up with Shawshank. And if you can't pull that off, you end up a dream catcher. And <laughs> you know, the, the, the gulf of, of effectiveness, you know, kind of between those two films, I think, is so shocking, considering that, you know, yeah. the talent involved with Shawshank and the talent involved with Dreamcatcher are basically equivalent, you know? Um, you had William Goldman writing, um, Lawrence Kasdan directing Dreamcatcher, and then I incredible A-list cast of really marvelous actors. And it's like, what what went wrong? You know, because nobody set out to make a bad adaptation of Dreamcatcher, but the movie, you know, the, the cast, crew, and everybody will admit the movie doesn't work. Right. Um, so it's like, what, what happened? Um, and there's no really easy answer to that. 
because you, you'd think there's a world where people who adored Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption might come in, look at Morgan Freeman playing the character of Red, who's supposed to be this, you know, jolly, heavy Irishman. Right. And, and disconnect from the material um, and, and be offended uh, for, the, for the audacity to make such a major change in, in a lead characterization. But, but that works, you know? Um, that works. I, I, I believe that the film, The Shawshank Redemption, is a stronger uh, piece of entertainment than the short story. Um, kind of, it, it's I, kind of a... I feel that way um, about the... Um... I feel a parallel way about the film Glen Gary Glenn Ross that the film is better than the play. Sure. Um, two quick things that pop into my mind uh, talking about screenplays, um, and you mentioned Morgan Freeman. You know the first Lethal Weapon. It's uh, written as two white guys, and uh, I actually um, uh, happened to be in New York when uh, Shawshank Redemption was being cast. And uh, I went over to, um, I don't know how I did this, was an assistant or Deborah Keeler herself when she was out in New York. Um, I came in and I auditioned twice, and it was so stupid because I was so young. But they had me keep, keep coming in for one of the parole board people. And when I saw the final film, it was like I was nowhere in the ballpark of the rural, older faces that they cast. But the coolest thing that came out of this, and this is, this is something that I'll never forget, Deborah said, you're interested in screenwriting and you're writing, Mark, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. She, and I, when does this happen? She gave me the entire script. She said, if you want to learn something about screenwriting, you've got to read this script. And I, and I took the thing and I worked backwards because I did not know this. Uh, I didn't know Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. So I got the screenplay and I, and I read it in the apartment of the friend I was staying with. And, um, I mean, it was, yeah, because I was reading screenplays and I was, you know, uh, doing that. Uh, I was ordering screenplay. I used to be able to get printed screenplays from, um, oh, God, there was a place in Hollywood that I wrote to. And, and for like uh, 10, 15 bucks, they would send you whatever the screenplay was. And um, it was before the Internet, you know, where you could almost find anything at any time. And uh, I just read this thing and then I went back and read the story and I said, I mean, it was a revelation. And I told dare about this story about four years ago. Um, I ran into him in San Diego, and this was just as... No, 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 no. This was just as The Walking Dead was launching. I hadn't even seen that. And I didn't know what that was going to do for him or what was going to happen to him. Um, but uh, we were able to talk about the screenplay and, and just talk about, you know, just shoot the shit. But um, it, was, it was part of my um, script learning you know, and it was just, you know, the casting yeah. director would just hand you a screenplay. Uh, you know, I guess this, you know, pre, pre big internet, there's no fear of uh, things being leaking. It was just an amazing thing to get that script. I didn't get cast too, but that's a different story. Um, it, is, it is one of the best, you know, the best adapted scripts I've ever read. It, I, I mean, it is. Um, and there's things that we've already touched on, like apt pupil, how disappointed I was. And again, you're looking at the talent and the people involved and it just, you know, but anyway. Oh, and by the way, Gerald's Game is another collaboration with Jeff Howard, right? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. and I'm sure, you know, it's uh, on the Internet. I can find it easily. Um, so Somnia, it's the same team, same production team, same producers. I'll never work with another DP uh, ever. Good for you. Like Seminari. Good. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of the same. A lot of the same people, um, and some of the same cast. There's a little bit of overlap, and some of the sets of people uh, pop up in it. Mm -hmm. But it, um, uh, my son is actually in it. Uh. Really kind of <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's it couldn't be a more different animal than Oculus, kind of to the point that I'm nervous about the reception. Um, oh, by the by the way, uh, um, well, I, um, I didn't mean to re interrupt you because I wanted to know more about it, but I don't want to. I don't want this interview to be about things that won't be evergreen, you know, a year from now, because um, we can talk about other things. But what's the deal with? And I and I can't believe I just remember this because I guess I put it out my mind. What's the reality if I know what you did last summer? 
speaking <laughs> speaking oh, of man. speaking that's of a different animal. Um, anyway. Oh, oh my God! No, that um, the uh, the trades. Um, I guess somebody at Sony leaked something about the project, and the trades ran with it um, in a way that was shocking and actually potentially detrimental to Gerald's game uh, when they announced because they had me producing and directing it, which is not true. Um, it's a, a writing <laughs> a writing assignment that we took. Um, when I when it became clear that I wouldn't be going into production this fall, oh. and um, and Sony had gotten in touch because they liked Oculus and they said we want to do uh, I know you did last summer reboot and our, our initial our initial reaction was to pass yeah um, and they came back and said before you pass here us out because we'd like to do something very very different with it and I went into the meeting saying well. You know, we, we would only really be interested if you're talking about a movie that isn't about teenagers, isn't about, you know, an elimination storyline of kids getting killed. Right. No fishermen with a hook, you know. Um, and the take we pitched them was kind of, you know, the, the only thing that's going to be kind of connectable to the original is just the title. And, and um, we pitched a take I never thought a studio would embrace. Um, and they did. Uh, I don't know what will happen. I don't know if they'll make our our take of it. Uh, but you know, we we're signed on just to deliver that draft, and then it's kind of up to them if they want to get other writers on it or if they want to go into production. Right. It'll be up to them. But um, it's uh, we we take a couple writing assignments a year um, just to keep the career moving and, and develop better studio relationships. Um, we take them quite quite often and, and they're never announced they're never kind of a big deal it's just something we do Some, sometimes yeah sometimes a title and this one got out and um is there and, and here's maybe a final question uh that that i'm sure is on your fans minds um I don't know, <laughs> you know the other take on it is you know that you 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 pitch them the idea that it's like red. You know it's Helen Mirren and Anthony Hopkins, and I can't remember what the fuck I did last summer, and uh, just see where that goes. But anyway, <laughs> you know, do it with an older kid. There's Morgan Freeman; he's still working. So anyway, um, is there movement from your team and the producers? I mean, is there the possibility of uh, of some more Oculus movies, if not from you, but from you know, is it possible that this mirror messes with some other people in the future? Uh, absolutely. We, we've actually had several meetings about it. Um, uh, the studio would love to do it. Uh, and so the, the trick for us has been, okay, well, what, you know, uh, where does it fit into into my availability? What level of involvement would I have with an Oculus sequel? And my, my instinct is to be protective of the franchise from a writing perspective, for sure. Um, they just might want to move faster on production uh, than, than I'll have availability for. Mm. Um, in which case, uh, you know, I, I'd be really interested in, in a version of, of events where, you know, Jeff and I would write a script that we believe in for a sequel and, you know, find a really exciting younger director um, that we could help kind of, you know, keep, keep, our, keep our eyes on the project to see what, what someone else's vision, you know, is able to kind of bring into that, to that mythology. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, we're definitely having the talks. Um, we don't know yet kind of what the best, uh, the best strategy is for that, but um, the movie performed well enough for everybody that, you know, there, there has been a lot of interest in this role. Um, one of the benefits of how long it took to get Oculus made at all was that we have piles of other stories uh, that there, a lot of them were abandoned concepts that we had initially looked at for the first film. And um, there's no shortage of, of material. It's just a question of timing and, and you know, what, what makes sense for for the, for the money people and, and the distribution people and, and whether or not, you know, whether or not my involvement is going to be, you know, really, really intense and on the ground or kind of more uh, detached this thing. Right, right. And, um, We'll know pretty soon, because uh, they do want an answer pretty soon. So, yeah. Well, good. Listen, I'm going to let you go and get back to work if you have to, and I'm going to get to some other things. And, um, yeah, let's... Uh
you know, as time unfolds, uh, see if we can't uh, get another couple of hours just to talk uh, talk about our lives and people in our lives and that kind of thing. I miss you. Miss you. I miss so. you too, sir. Uh, it would be great. So I, I, I love catching up, and, and thanks, uh, thanks for reaching out and, and setting this up. This has been great. Thank you for listening to the Redfield Arts Review. Please come back again for our next show. The Redfield Arts Review and the original content of this program is copyright the Mark Redfield Company. Shopping for explosives by Coconut Monkey Rocket. Licensed under Attribution Non-Commercial International License. All other content used by permission of the respective rights holders or used for educational and informational purposes. Original music, sound design, and engineering is by Jennifer Rouse. This is your announcer, Mary Ann Perry. Available now from Redfield Arts Audio. Redfield Arts Audio. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial of his approach. Bah, said Scrooge. Humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that. I am who sure. are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Hey, can you? And what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long. Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart! It's Fezziwig alive again! Come in! Come in and know me better, man! I am the ghost of Christmas present! Look upon me! As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley and, lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens As told by Mark Redfield Music and sound design by Jennifer Rouse From Redfield Arts Audio